Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Hatfield Congregational Church on this beautiful fall morning. Welcome back to Standard Time. I hope you're all well rested with that extra hour of sleep that you had last night. That means that we can have an extra energetic worship this morning. The chat and coffee is offered by Anita in the back pew there, and so we thank Anita for chat and coffee. You know the drill. Uh, Linda's right there, and if you have any gift cards that you'd like to purchase for Big Y or Stop and Shop. Also, the Horn of Plenty food drive is going to be going on throughout November until Thanksgiving, and uh, this uh, benefits the Survival Center in Northampton. So if you'd like to bring in any kind of non-perishable food items, um, we'll put that in the cart in the back, and then the kids will eventually bring that up here. We'll fill up that hoard of plenty. If you want to make a cash donation, you can do that through the church as well, uh, because they buy in bulk, and whatever we give them as cash, they can do a lot more than we can by going to the grocery store. So if you'd like to help in that way, you can do that as well. And like I said, that'll be there throughout the, uh, the month of November. Um, let's see, I think we want to talk about yesterday's roast pork dinner. And I think Jonathan, the chair of the Board of Trustees, will be giving that. Well, we made it through another roast pork dinner, and uh, the trustees would like to thank everyone that helped. You know, without all the congregation working on it, we wouldn't be able to do it. So, um, as of now, we're at $2,300 in climbing. So, <laughs> and there is, of course, uh, pork left over. All right, John. Thanks. I um I came in late yesterday because I I went to the uh, annual meeting out in Worcester and uh, people worked awfully awfully hard on this. It is a lot of work, and I know there might have been stuff before, but it's Thursday, it's Friday, it's Saturday. Um, so a lot of people put in an awful lot of hours to make that $2,300 possible. And so uh, I know we clapped and, ex and you know, uh, expressed our thanks to them, but really, without those people, um, we'd really be in a tough spot. So to everyone who worked, thank you very, very much for all of that. The stewardship campaign continues. Wonderly. Uh, we are at um, 26000 so we are halfway to our goal. And uh, thank everybody who's uh, already uh, pledged. There are more pledge cards on the table. If you didn't get a pledge card for some reason and were overlooked by our great committee here, <laughs> sorry, but there are more pledge cards up there if you need them. All right? Thank you. So halfway there, people, halfway there. Also, this afternoon from 5.30 to 7.30 in Hadley, we will be going to the uh, Hampshire Association Youth Group meeting. And um, they already have their uh, program set, their activity set. Uh, we're going to have dinner, and uh, Sharon volunteered. She's going to help me make, uh, well, actually, she's going to make uh, two pans of cornbread. Uh, so we're going to be heading over there, and it uh, should be fun. The, uh, we added another church this month to the Hampshire Association Youth Group, so that group is growing. And so I know we've got injuries and et cetera, but if anybody wants to go with me this afternoon, I know I've talked to you. I, um, I'll be here at 5 o'clock, and we'll just go across the river for 5.30 to 7.30 this afternoon. Exploring the Bible Study Group is tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, that is by the Massachusetts Bible Society, and it is an ongoing course. We start off talking about how the Bible came to be, then we'll work our way into the Old Testament and into the New Testament. And I think it's really important for us to have a better understanding of the Bible because sometimes I hear the strangest things uh, coming from people who say, this is what the Bible says. Uh, so if you would like to have your own idea of what the Bible says, uh, ask questions that maybe you, know, you can find your own answers to, I invite you to come tomorrow, 7 to 8 o'clock, out in our parlor for exploring the Bible. Also, we are going to be participating in a Thanksgiving ecumenical prayer service at Our Lady of Grace Roman Catholic Church on Sunday the 24th, which is the Sunday prior to Thanksgiving, and that will be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I mentioned that this far in advance, but maybe you can put that on your calendar so that there's nothing else that can conflict with that, and we can hopefully have a nice turnout for the Thanksgiving ecumenical, especially as we approach our 350th anniversary as Hatfield. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Uh, oh, yes, Anthony. <laughs> so today at 3 o'clock, I'm uh, involved in a concert of medieval music at the Renaissance Center in Amherst. So I've switched some things around with the prelude and postlude. I'll be playing uh, some songs from that concert in a different context. 
Now we've got recorders, medieval drum, percussion, finger cymbals, everything. It's going to be really cool. Uh, I'll be in full costume. So if you want to see uh, the three little pigs enacted in Middle English, definitely uh, Renaissance Center at three. Uh, but you'll hear me play the recorder later on in the service for the communion and the post food. Um, people don't really think the recorder is a real instrument, but it is. You'll see, it can actually sound pretty nice. Um, and my friends asked me to bring out my Chinese instruments for this concert for some reason. Uh, but this is an arhu. I'll be playing the prelude on this instrument. Everybody always asks uh, how it works and what it is, so I thought I'd tell all of you at once. It is a two-string, they call it the Chinese violin uh, because the title R means two in Chinese and Hu is the kind of instrument that it is. You play the two strings with the bow kind of in between the two and uh, it's real snake skin on the front which gives it that interesting uh, timbre. So can you actually help me with this? I'm gonna show you how I play the piano. Oh really? Are we, are we going right into Prelude? Okay, hey, I just want to make one other mention before we go into Prelude. Um, we're going to be calling Marty up in a little bit. Um, the first Sunday of the month, we always ask a leader of the church to come forward and, and call to worship. And uh, Marty is our collector. And since we're halfway through with the, uh, the, fund, the stewardship campaign, she is the one uh, that collects those monies. So it's only her and uh, Mark Gillott, the treasurer, who know actual personal donations to the church. No one else needs to know. Uh, but Marty will be coming up. And when she does, we'll also be doing the reading of the covenant, which is blue hymnal number 359. So so please have that ready and raring to go. And now I get to be a musician. Oh, yeah. All right. What am I doing? You're going to press this button. No way. I'm doing more than that. <laughs> so, right there. Right. so uh, button Yeah. Right there. Hit it. That's all I'm doing? That's it. That's the secret. That's how I do it. Just to show off. <laughs> Ten years of piano lessons. <laughs> All right, here we go.
choir. Thank you, Anthony. So the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we come together to worship on this gorgeous Sunday morning. As I mentioned um, yesterday and the day before, I went to the annual meeting of our uh, soon-to-be Southern New England Conference, and it was in Worcester at the DCU Center. And uh, the whole theme of the, uh, of the uh, annual meeting was unbound. And I think you all know the Lazarus story, how uh, he's dead four days in the tomb, and Jesus calls him out, and he's still got uh, the burial cloths wrapped around him, and Jesus says, you know, unbind him from those burial cloths. And that was the theme of the, of the whole annual meeting, about being unbound. And uh, so they had these um, muslin, they had these muslin cloths uh, strewn behind all of the chairs throughout the DCU center, and they were all tied together with these knots. And so one of these hands-on things, they wanted us to wrap our hands in this, this muslin cloth uh, to symbolize being bound. And then they wanted to symbolize being unbound. They had it somehow tied in a knot, and you're supposed to just pull on it, and the knot comes undone, and you get that beautiful message of being unbound. So everybody's doing that, and they're all unbound. My knot got tighter. <laughs> so I have no idea how all I had to do was pull this thing, and it would be uh, unbound. But mine got just tighter. Uh, but, well, I was sitting with Reverend Will Sensible. You may remember him from uh, my my, uh, my uh, ecclesiastical council, uh, no, my installation, and uh, so he helped me, but I, uh, I could not get unbound uh, from my muslin cloth. So I, I just thought that was par for the course. Also, I should have mentioned this earlier, over here on this table, if you didn't have a chance last week, um, Marge Kowalski is gonna be 101 years old on Veterans Day. Uh, so she was born on the last day of World War I and uh, she is 101 this Veterans Day. And so if you haven't had a chance to sign her card, she is the oldest living resident of Hatfield and also obviously the oldest resident, or oldest member of Hatfield Congregational. So I do hope you'll take the chance uh, to sign her birthday card. So Marty, do you wanna come on up now and we'll do the call to worship and then she'll take us into the covenant. Don't forget the mic. Is it on? Now it is. Okay. Uh, if you'd order, open your um, order of worship, and we will read the call to worship together. We cry out to Jesus for the help we need. How will we know we have been heard? We will know because Jesus stands with us and sends visions of new possibilities. He encourages us to believe creatively. Here we stand watch for the Christ appearing. Together we seek his presence and aspire to fulfill his plans. Surely Jesus is in this place and will give us the understanding. He recalls us to the values we too often neglect. His righteousness is everlasting, and his law is truth. Listen to all that Jesus would teach us. Hear the word of God. We seek to grow in faith and in love for one another. We would learn to do good and to work for justice. Praise, Praise be to God. God. Amen. And now if you'll open your blue hymnal to page 359, we will read the affirmation of faith together. I believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we will sing hymn number 283 in the blue hymnal.
So as I mentioned, I was at the annual meeting yesterday, and there's literally hundreds of us coming together to do the work of God, to do the work of Christ in a church unbound by walls, and that is the spirit I'd like you to share each other with, the uh, gift of peace. Uh, we all come together, but we are all part of a bigger reality that is God's world, the gift of peace. Peace be with you, Bernie. <laughs> peace, Bill. And peace be with you. I like the tie. <laughs> hey, Jane, how are you? Peace be with you. Nice to see you. Peace be with you guys. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Oh, hey, oh, thank you. Hi there. Hey, peace be with you. And peace be with you. Peace be with you, Amy. Peace, Jonathan. Peace, Gronk. young people please come forward all right I'm gonna sit here in the middle we don't have a ton of you today so I'm gonna sit right here all right whoa all right you survived though good just shake it off there you go come on right up here it's safer okay there we go all right so guys it's autumn and apples. Um, your schools ever take you out for apple picking? Your parents ever take you out for apple picking? So you all been to an orchard to be apple picking? You've never been apple picking? Nope. Really? What? Oh, that's not true? No. I went to Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay, so you went to apple picking. You've been apple picking? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So these are two different apples. This one here is from Clarkdale Farm, just up past my house, and this is called a uh, Honeycrisp. It's my favorite apple, but I'm cheap, and so this is a, from a utility thing, and so I think they found this on the ground or something like that. Bye, Eden. Bye. I'll give you an apple if you stay. No? Okay. So you see my utility apple? You see all these bruises and stuff like that? They can't sell these as good apples because it's bruised, it's got these little cuts and dents in there. This is a red delicious apple. That thing is like picture perfect apple. It's perfect red, it's shiny and everything else. There's no taste in this apple. This looks pretty, but there's no taste. I can eat cardboard and have as much apple taste as I can out of this red delicious apple. So this here apple is designed to look pretty this here apple look, doesn't look so pretty, but it's delicious. I love this apple. We're going to hear a story when you're in Sunday school about a little guy named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was not liked. He was the guy, um, everybody in town did not want to know him. They didn't like him. They wanted to stay away from him. Jesus comes into town, and Zacchaeus wants to meet him so badly, he's a little short dude, he can't see over the crowd. So what was the apple story? He was, he was apple picking, Zacchaeus was? Yeah. All right, let's say he was apple picking. So Zacchaeus went up into this apple tree, and so he knew Jesus was going to be walking down the road, and so he went ahead of them. He climbed up into the apple tree, and he waited there for Jesus to come by. He just wanted to see Jesus. He didn't want anybody to see him, but he wanted to see Jesus. When Jesus comes to that apple tree, he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to have dinner at your house tonight. So Jesus doesn't care what he looks like. 
Jesus cares what he is. And so Jesus goes to become a friend with this Zacchaeus that nobody else liked. And what the story is, is that afterwards, after long years after, after Jesus has come, after Jesus has gone, a lot of years have passed by, every day Zacchaeus would go with a little pot of water and he would give some extra water to that apple tree because that apple tree is where he met Jesus, his friend. So you never want to worry about the outward appearance, because that's pretty, but it's no taste. You want to concentrate on what a person is. And our job as Christians is to try to find out what's inside a person that makes them special to us and to God. Okay, you have any stories for me? Yeah. What? Um, um, I, I did a thing because those are the Okay, older brother, what is he saying? You don't know either? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, guys, enjoy Sunday school. Hey, does anybody want the undelicious red delicious? All right, I share this one with you, but it's all beat up. Does anybody want? No? You want this one? All right, if you get a worm, it's, it's only more vitamins. I offered you one. You want that one? Okay. All right, guys. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday school. Wait, wait, is it good? It's like nothing. Oh, it doesn't taste very good. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
very nice. So it's now time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. I'd like to begin with a prayer uh, for a dear member of this congregation, Carol Benson. Uh, yesterday she had to call the ambulance at her home and uh, be taken down to Bay State Medical. And uh, so I saw her yesterday my way back from Worcester, and uh, she had just moved up from the ER to a... Uh, another room that was only separated by curtains. Uh, so I hope she got into a room to get a little bit of rest, but uh, when I saw her about six o'clock yesterday, she'd already had a pretty tough day. Uh, she was gonna spend the night, and I don't know anything more than that. We'll find out more today. Uh, but please keep Carol, Carol Benson in your prayers that um, she may have a full and complete recovery and be able to return home. Also, I'd like to say a prayer. Um, you probably don't know her, but um, up in South Deerfield, there's a woman who's also 101 years old, and I received a call from her daughter only a couple of weeks ago asking that, you know, when the time comes, um, you know, if I'd be able to, to do her funeral home service. And so we were talking about her mother, who's 101, and so I'm in my hotel room on Friday waiting to go to the uh, annual meeting, and I get a call from Risley's funeral home, and I say, oh, I know what this is going to be about. And so instead of the 101-year-old mother, her 75-year-old daughter uh, fell down some stairs and died at the bottom of the stairs. Um, so we will be saying prayers for Tofi Novak. Um, please keep her in your prayers, um, and also her sister, Suzanne, uh, that whole family, because uh, that's just a, a tragedy that um, with all the stuff going on with their mother, um, that she had that tragic accident at home. So we'll keep, keep on our prayers, Tofi Novak. Also, we continue to have two private intentions offered for health and recovery uh, for members of this church. We also continue to pray for Ed McCarthy, who is here. Uh, we're glad to see Ed, and uh, he keeps battling all those different things that he has, and he keeps showing up. What? You'll know more again tomorrow. All right, so Ed, you're always in our prayers. Continue to pray for a friend of this church, uh, Charlie Kellogg. We pray for a friend of mine, Doug Bilecki, who is battling his cancer down in uh, Georgia. We continue to pray for Glenn and Denise Wagner, and also for Muriel Kilbovich, and we continue to offer prayers for Lynn Omasta as she is treated for her cancer. Are there any other prayers, joys, celebrations you'd like to share? Yes, Marcia. In the parlor? Okay. All right. Any other prayers, joys, celebrations? Uh, prayers for my sister. She's been in the hospital for three weeks. Three weeks? Yep. Okay. Okay. What's her first name? Robin. Robin? Okay. Can we say a little prayer for Maddie? We're so glad to have her back. Last week we... Uh, Last week we said prayers because she had a torn ACL, I believe it was, and uh, had a little bit of a rough go and had to spend the night in the hospital, but she's here. And I saw her yesterday at the dinner, and I was talking to somebody, and I saw this whiz go by, and it was Maddie on crutches doing 90. <laughs> so, uh, so we're glad to have you back with us, though, and on the road to recovery. Anything else? All right, let us just turn inward for a few moments uh, to talk to Jesus just inside ourselves.
transforming Savior, we sometimes find ourselves up a tree seeking to observe you only from a safe distance like Zacchaeus from Jericho, while you insist instead to come close enough to be welcomed into our homes, into our workplaces, into our communities. Come into our hearts to reorder our priorities and save us so that we may be a blessing to those who need the love that you will offer through us. With this in mind, may we encounter you and draw closer to you in our special moments of prayer and of worship that truly are a blessing to us every single day and every single week as we come to this, your house. And may we now come together in saying the words that Jesus himself gave us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus Christ came into the world to seek out and to save all who were lost. Sometimes those who have much are lost because of their possessions. However, the offering becomes an important part of our worship when we are centered on the steadfast love of Jesus for all people and all of creation. And then our possessions become instruments of God's grace for us and for others as well. And the loss can be found through our church ministries. May we be as generous as our faith expects and, of course, as our situation in life allows. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. Zacchaeus had so much love for that sycamore or apple tree that he cared for it the rest of his life because that's where he came to know God. We also offer these our gifts so that we can care for this, our place where we can come to know God better. 
We pray, Lord, that these gifts may continue to help us in our worship, to come closer to you, and may also help us in our ministry to all the world. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we can now raise our voices in joyous song with that extra hour of sleep behind us. We get to now sing from the red hymnal number 287, Here, O my Lord, I see thee. This morning's reading is from the book of Habakkuk, chapters one, um, chapter one, one through four, and chapter two, verses one through four. Now, if you're like me, you're probably wondering what the heck the book of Habakkuk is. Um, the book of Habakkuk is the eighth of the Terah Asar, which is the 12 minor prophets. The term denotes the short length 
of the text in relation to the longer prophetic texts known as the major prophets. And the book is divided into three chapters. Chapter one is a dialogue between God and the prophet, and that is the, um, mostly the chapter that I'm reading from. So chapter one of Habakkuk, the prophet's complaint. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. And then God's reply to the prophet's complaint. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. Thanks, Glenda. It sounds like somebody wants to go to Bible study tomorrow. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he, is gone to, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner? But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone anything, I will pay them back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. So as I've mentioned several times already, these past two days I was in Worcester at our annual meeting of the conference, which is soon to be the Southern New England Conference, but we are right now still the Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island conferences, and that's going to last until December 31st. Then on New Year's Day, we come together to form the larger Southern New England Conference. And as usual, you know, business is necessary, but it's not exciting. So as usual, the highlight of these kind of gatherings was the worship. And the keynote speaker was the founder of a group called Revolutionary Love. And her name is Valerie, and she is extremely well-educated. I think I remember her mentioning Stanford, Yale, and Harvard as her pedigree. So this, this is a very intelligent woman. And she brought her revolutionary love into being after the terrorist attacks of 9-11 with a hope of healing because those attacks soon became more than news from 3,000 miles away. She's from California. They became extremely personal to her. The first person murdered in the United States in a vigilante reaction to 9-11 was a member of the Sheikh religion. He was murdered outside of a gas station that he owned in Arizona. Sheik men wear those turbans because a sign of their religion is their long hair, so the men will wrap their hair underneath that turban. So he's wearing a turban, but he's not Muslim. He's, the Sheik religion started in India, but they're not Hindus either. Sheiks respect the good and the divine in all faiths. But this man was murdered because someone thought that that turban made him a threat to the United States of America just because he looked different. And the man who was killed, the man who was murdered, was Valerie's uncle. 
So after working for many years trying to heal the divisions and hatreds that are bound in our country, Valerie is about to give up because the number of hate crimes in our country is higher now than at 9-11, and all of the work that she said that she had done, it just didn't seem to be accomplishing anything. Things were getting worse. And so the divisions have become more stark, they become more scary, and they seem to have become more established. And she was ready to throw in the towel. A girl with Stanford, Yale, and Harvard and her pedigree can go on and do all kinds of things, so why continue to do this if you're not accomplishing anything? So at her darkest point, her uncle, the murdered man's brother, suggested that they should call the man convicted of murder and talk to him while he's in prison for the rest of his life. And the conversation was painful. It took them 15 years before they could get to the point of wanting to talk to the man who for no reason killed her uncle, his brother, because he had a turban on his head. However, in that conversation, even the murderer became known to her as a person, a terribly, horribly flawed person, a terribly, horribly violent person, but still a person, not a monster, not a caricature, not something seen from a distance, but he became a person. Not a person you want to go out and hug and embrace and cuddle with, but he still was a person. She realized that stories can create the wonder that turns strangers into people that stories can help us to see no strangers. And this is what she deemed the first lesson of revolutionary love, to see no strangers. And this helped her to see the darkness of an increasingly violent and divided world, and she asked out loud, she asked the hundreds of us gathered at the DCU Center this weekend, what if this is not the darkness of the tomb, what if this is the darkness of the womb? What if this is the moment before the transition to a new life, a life unbounded, which was the overall theme of our annual meeting? What if it is the darkest before the sun comes out? What if this, this horrible stuff that we're all hearing about in the news so constantly about wars and fights and all over the world, there are these, these mass uprisings of people who are just sick and tired of the way that they are being treated by their governments. What if all of that is about to change and there's a new life, new light? That's what's giving her hope to continue. The whole possibility and potential of an unbounded church and an unbounded society begins with the stories that help us to have no strangers. So the evangelist Luke tells us the story about a little despised man by the name of Zacchaeus. And we finally even get to know his name. It's Zacchaeus. Remember last week we talked about a tax collector. We don't know who he was. All we know is he was a tax collector, a publican. Now we start to get a name. It's Zacchaeus. So just like last Sunday, we're back into that tax collector theme. A person hated by most everyone. It was his work that funded the Roman army so that the Roman Empire could rule over the land of Israel. And in the process, they would usually steal, and so they got rich themselves. And it says Zacchaeus was a rich man. So Zacchaeus was an intentional stranger, a stranger to everyone. He knows no one. No one knows Zacchaeus. No one wanted to know Zacchaeus or anything about him. And then one day... He hears that this Jesus is passing through Jericho, his hometown. He's too short to catch a glimpse of this man over the crowd. He rushes down the road and he climbs a tree where he knows Jesus will pass. And I don't imagine he wanted to be discovered up in that tree. He just wants to see Jesus. And all of a sudden, with Jesus right below him as he's vulnerable up in that tree, the procession stops. Jesus looks up and he calls Zacchaeus by name. He knows Zacchaeus. The tax collector, he's got to be scared. He's up in a tree surrounded by people who do not like him. And so Jesus surprises him, though, not with condemnations, not with you know, accusations, not with threats of violence. He surprises Zacchaeus with kind words. And he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going to eat at your house tonight. I'm going to come and have a meal with you. Jesus wants to share stories so that there will be no strangers. When the crowd, though, hears this, and remember, he's on the road to Jerusalem. All these people are following Jesus because they think he's going to be the Messiah King, the one who's going to pick up a sword and he's going to defeat the Romans. We're going to have our own country and we're going to take those Romans and we're going to kill them all. That's what they're thinking as they're following Jesus through Jericho, they're going up to Jerusalem. 
So now he stops and gives time to Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And the crowd begins to grumble and to complain, how dare Jesus eat with such a person, such a sinner, such a stranger. But Jesus, with this revolutionary love that he lives, he will not accept that anyone is a stranger, that they have to be strangers forever. Rather, says Jesus, I have come, and this is one of those beautiful lines from Jesus throughout the gospel, I have come to seek out and to save the lost. Seek out and to save the lost. So Jesus tells his story. Luke hears it. Luke retells the story in the Bible. We continue to tell that story now for 2,000 years, and we see the wonder that stories have the ability to turn strangers into people, that stories can help us see no strangers, and healing becomes possible, or at least the process begins. Now this is the message that we as church need to share every day if the darkness is not to be the tomb, but the womb. We, as the living, breathing church, need to listen to the stories of others instead of looking right past them as if they were strangers not worthy of our attention. We, as the church, the people meet on the street. They drive by a building, but they meet us, the church, on the street. We need to respect others enough to let them not be ignored. We are the church unbounded by walls. We are the church that Jesus sends out to tell his stories so that there are no more strangers anymore. There's an amazing line in the reading from the prophet Habakkuk that Glenda just read for us. This was a time when the usual speed, the fastest speed that they could achieve was a human person running, because a lot of people couldn't afford a chariot. So the human speed, running, was the height of fast. So today's equivalent would be all those billboards that you see as you're speeding down the highway, or as you're speeding to church and you get pulled over by a cop because you're going a little bit too fast in the morning. But as you're speeding along and you see those highway signs, well, that's what the prophet Habakkuk is talking about. He says, God tells the prophet, write down this vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. So it's got to be big enough so as you're running past, as you're screaming past in your car, you can see it. In other words, speak the message loud and clear. Live the message loud and clear. Make sure that no one can miss it. Let it be as intrusive as all those signs along the highway. Whatever you do, make sure that people know what church is all about. There will be no more strangers. And so that's that same message that Valerie calls revolutionary love. It's what Jesus loved, lived when he stopped and called him Zacchaeus and said, I'm going to stay in your house. And it's what we're supposed to do as followers of this very same Jesus. We are called to be revolutionary Christians by not seeing anyone as a stranger. You know, the guy after 9-11, I remember how I felt after 9-11. I felt that same kind of anger. But you know, the guy, just because he had a turban, was an enemy of the entire United States of America. And you know the, what's going on in our world today. You know the separation. You know the, the prejudice. You know all that stuff that's going on out there. We have to be revolutionary Christians and not let people become caricatures, not let people become monsters. We have to see them as people. So let us keep that thought in mind as we move from here to the communion table, to sit there with Jesus, to sit there with each other, and to share a meal, just like Jesus did at Zacchaeus' house and think unbounded by these beautiful walls of this building. Think about all the others worldwide, Protestant and Catholic, who are this day sharing in communion and realize there are no strangers. We're coming together at communion to be with one another. And as we profess, all are welcome at this table. There are no strangers. And think about the fact that Jesus was born as one of us, a person just like us. We're all in a sacred communion because Jesus lived life as us. All human life is sacred. And really, God, through Jesus, has made all of creation sacred. And that is truly a revolutionary love. And we need to believe in it. And we need to live it clearly so that even a runner may read it. In Jesus' name we pray as we transition to communion. Amen. And I do believe in your bulletins. You all have the insert for communion. (laughs) 
This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of all God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death and appeared to Mary Magdalene. On that same day, sat at the table with two disciples and made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Women and men, youth and children, gather round Christ's table. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of all God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God the Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. With your daughters and sons of faith in all times and in all places, we praise you with joy by saying, Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God most high, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of Jesus' betrayal and desertion, that he took bread, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread.
In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Minister to you in Christ's name, I share with you the cup. We will now join together in the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, who may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. All right, let us bring our sacrament of communion to a conclusion by singing blue hymnal number 436, Shalom to you now.
us now turn back to our bulletins for our benediction response. When you arrive home, remember that a guest awaits you there. Jesus Christ wants to stay at your houses today. Let us give thanks to Christ for the gift of his abiding presence, a gift that makes our homes places of selfless love and of nurture. Jesus will help us fulfill the good we resolve to accomplish. The name of Christ will be glorified in the lives that we will live. Today, salvation comes to our homes. Today, our homes are blessed with the abiding presence of the loving Savior. So, let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord as best that we are able. Is she just pressing the button, though? No. No? Oh, okay. (laughs) 